how are we going to integrate uh, two systems in 2020, machine type communications and wireless access systems? Uh, they are designed for different purposes. Uh, there was an analogy made in the panel that uh, uh, 4G systems is like a Ferrari, uh, high data rates, uh, rate requirements and so on. And uh, machine type communications is like a pickup truck, right? Uh, why do we need to combine them and put, put them in one box? Well, you know, you have realized that the industry has very different understanding what really an M2M -M system is. So some understand it to be just this really low rate type of system collecting data like the smart meters, file arms, etc. Others think it's like the sensors in your mobile phones, they would collect a lot of data and just use the the cellular data pipe to offload that data. Um, yet other people say, you know, also our camera system, so really a lot of unstructured video data should be part of this M2M uh, ecosystem because it's a machine, the camera talking to another machine, which might be a, you know, a software which is analyzing this automatically. So we have a wide variety really of uh, underlying technologies, data rates, applications, etc. So that's, that's a starting point, which I think makes the whole discussion very difficult uh, for everybody really to follow. Now, there's a very big ecosystem, M2M ecosystem now developing with, uh, out of the cellular community simply because we need right now, 2014, to connect quite a lot of sensors and we can't do that yet using uh, cellular technology because the energy consumption simply is too, too, too large, okay? So I can't really change my battery every eight months or nine months, okay? And uh, also the cost, but maybe not the modem cost. So the modem cost is okay, we can live with that, but the data plan. So if you go to the operator and you ask them, you know, what's, your, what, what's a good data plan you can offer? They're still too high, prices are coming down, but it's still too high to really have a a good business model there. So we kind of go out in the non-licensed technology. It's kind of almost a backup thing, okay? And there we have the choice between using Zigbee-like technologies, which I think a lot of people realized whilst it is cheap. Um, it is actually low power, which gives you short range, so you need to build up multi-hop mesh networks, which often fail, so you can't really have a lot of industrial applications. The other choice is Wi-Fi. People woke up to Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi actually, if you tune it a little bit, can consume very little energy and suddenly you realize, hey, you know, in most places where I want to instrument something, whether it's a sensor, whether it's some video traffic, whatever, you actually do have Wi-Fi. Okay, so if we could solve the mobility and roaming issue, which, you know, Wi-Fi uh, open spot to zero, I think, is solving, solving, then that's already a good ecosystem. And in fact, Broadcom, Broadcom actually realized that and they start really to, to bet a lot on the, on the low power Wi-Fi ecosystem. But then we also would like to have a large coverage and then systems which we call the low power wide area networks like Sigfox, uh, Newell, um, Semtech and Rambon, et cetera, et cetera, are actually emerging. But their proprietary technologies, so probably their use is a little bit limited if you uh, look at the long horizon. So we are back to the cellular community. But the business case is, is fairly weak. So the operators clearly make a lot of money uh, or sufficient money with us using the mobile phones. The question is, you know, uh, will the machines make sufficient money for them to actually offer data plans which are kind of interesting to those to use it? And if they don't, even the manufacturers wouldn't be able to do anything because they are dependent on the rollout strategy of the operators. So the, all, the whole M2M ecosystem in the cellular context really depends very much on some technology factors. Will we be able really to build a system which has a very low energy consumption? It doesn't have battery, it doesn't have to be battery time, a lifetime of 10 years. Nobody really needs it, frankly speaking. It would be nice, but uh, you know, if you do it two years or four years, it's already good enough for all the verticals I know about. And um, and then the pricing, you know, the monthly pricing. Once that works out, I think 4G, 5G will be a good solution for M2M -M traffic. And it will happen. But why 5G? Because you just mentioned Wi-Fi solutions. Can't we just use Wi-Fi, for example, at the in the indoor? In many, many scenarios, it looks like it fits. Uh, why do we need a new type of uh, communications for this? Yes. Uh, good question. So as of 2014, probably I would say, you know, cellular is not ready yet, so I will have my low-power Wi-Fi chip connected to my sensor, and that one needs to talk to my access point. One of the problems we have today is, is how do you authenticate the sensor with the access point, okay? So you know when you use your mobile phone, um, you either make it open to, the access point is open to everybody, so you just click and connect, or you put a password. Now, how do you do that? 
Okay, there are companies who have solved the problem, but it's a real pain. You can't really roll out billions of sensors and program a password manually. So we need some orchestration really on this end from the IEEE, and that's happening. I'm not saying this is not happening. So people are thinking about how to do that so that you just roll out your, your sensor network, you automatically connect to the Wi-Fi which is there, and you sort out all the billing and authentication later on. Okay, how about the architecture in general um, in wireless access networks when it is integrated with to, with machine type communications, uh, how it will evolve? Um, we can, uh, for example, looking at the machine type communications uh, or uh, wireless access uh, in separate. Mm -hmm. So the the 4G and a half 5G architecture will will probably not make a quantum leap. Okay, so the architecture that will will play out is maybe we will have a new air interface. We always kind of need a new air interface to go to the regulator and ask for more and different spectrum. That's the actual rational. Okay, but you know if we just get on with the old LTE type A type of spectrum access methods, I mean it would probably just be okay. We just need more spectrum, so to say, to to really be able to to leverage on the higher data rate requirements. Now, so. There will be changes in the interface because we always have them in 5G. In terms of the actual core network, um, there seems to be very little appetite to actually work a lot on that. So uh, I think in 4G we have achieved already quite a flattening and end-to-end IP type of architecture, but the core is still there. Okay. So the problem with the core is, is that um, you do silly things like you know, you make a phone call in Glasgow, it goes to the uh, base station E node B, goes to the serving gateway, goes to the packet gateway, and then goes out and maybe goes to a uh, different operator's packet gateway, goes back to the service gateway, goes back to E node B, and, uh, and maybe to your friend in Glasgow who's just 10 meters beside you asking where you are. And, uh, but both packet gateways are maybe in South and England, okay? Mm -hmm. So it travels like a uh, thousand kilometers, your stuff up and down just to go. So it's it might be okay for consumer type of applications, so voice, video, etc. But it will definitely not work out for the delay requirements and the scalability requirements of M2M traffic. So the best thing you could probably do is just get rid of the core. So that's what we're trying to do. So really trying to get rid of the whole core network altogether, um, bring in. The beauty of the internet, how it is scaled really with its flat architecture, okay, the flat IP architecture, even though the routing is hierarchical, but I mean, just as you look at it, it's just a real, really heavy mesh peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and uh, and don't kill everything of the core network. Of course, there are beautiful things in the core network, like the authentication capabilities, okay, the uh, um, the mobility and uh, handover type of and roaming capabilities and the billing capabilities. So 3GPP is very good in billing the edges and supporting mobility, but it's uh, very poor and kind of uh, really providing s ultra scalable rates like we have seen in the IEEE community and the internet community in general. So therefore, we would need probably to marry the strengths of both communities. So we take out the authentication billing stuff um, maybe into a virtual entity. So we're not only 3GPP technology, but also IEEE technology, new millimeter wave stuff, etc. cetera, can just all pull in. So you can suddenly bill all these edges, which was one of the problem of Wi-Fi. You know, you can't really bill Wi-Fi these days, okay? And uh, at the same time, maybe do all the mobility management rather uh, terminal driven. Okay, so because we have, we know where we are. We, you can map probably some base stations. You could probably really make sure that the terminal helps a lot, all the handover and mobility type of uh, procedures instead of doing it in the network. Okay, also because the terminals today are actually being changed every every one, two, three years. Okay, and uh, base stations are being changed what every five years. So there's a long time when the mobile terminal itself is computationally more capable when, than a base station. So why don't we exploit that, okay? So put more type of uh, mobile mobile related things like mobility handovers, roaming, et cetera, into the, into the terminal and outsource the rest of the beauty of the 3GPP core into some virtual entity, but where also other communities could really profit from that. Looking at this uh, architectural design uh, of a new 5G system, integrated system, uh, where are the research challenges here? New routing uh, problems, uh, clustering problems, uh, what type of uh, new problems are uh, coming out to study? So let's go from the wireless edge down to the core, okay? The internet. So on the edge, really, I think people start to talk a lot about uh, D2D, 
So it's, uh, it's a topic which in the academia has been researched now for a while, but I think there are a lot of really interesting challenges, particularly in the M2M space where maybe you want to connect a sensor to a, an actuator, and how do you make this happen now, maybe also under conditions when the overall control network coverage is not there. Okay, so therefore D2D in unfederated mode is an interesting area to look at. The second topic is really on the decoupling of uplink and downlink. So we observed with Vodafone, we work on that. We observed that, uh, you know, if you are connected to a micro or pico or femtocell and you walk away, okay, there comes a point when it makes sense actually to have your uplink to the pico cell or femtocell and your downlink actually on the macro cell. Uh, so you need to separate that, okay? There's a whole zone when it makes sense. So as you go further and further, of course, at some point it makes sense to have both uplink and downlink um, on the macro cell. And if you get closer and closer, uplink and downlink both on the, on the femto cell. But there's a ring where you should decouple that. You can't do that today. And the only way of doing this today is really if you also decouple the control in the data channel. And that is happening as well. So there are other uh, challenges there happening. Um, we need to do more than the femto, uh, phantom cell approach of the Japanese. I think that's a concept we can really work on much, much more um, to really bring out completely new concept and think maybe a little bit about how can we bring this beyond cellular so all the other ecosystem could also profit from a kind of a global control infrastructure. Yeah. And then as we move in, um, Clearly, people talk a lot about you know the massive amount of antennas, whether they're really in one place or in different places. So I think massive, massive MIMO, whether distributed or centralized, will play a significant role. We will need to work a lot on the backhaul because that suddenly becomes the, the bottleneck. So imagine you have a millimeter wave access with 10 gigabit per second per user. You know how do you offload this in the, in the backhaul? So that's the next problem. And then you need to get it through the core network. And uh, my prediction is, is that there's just no way you can do that with a core as it is. You know, there will be no serving and packet gateway which could really handle that type of traffic. You would need to be built dedicated fiber throughout a whole country just to do that. It's kind of economically, I'm not sure whether an operator should do that. Um, and, you know, one of the other big advantages of getting rid of the core is that you let other communities who are really used in building this infra uh, internet infrastructure do the job. Yeah. So therefore, uh, trying to see how how can we really get rid of the core network without killing the business for the operators nor the manuf manufacturers, whilst bringing in uh, other ecosystems which have become very very strong over the past years, like IEEE, a type of communities. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah.